Grammar Girl is brought to you by Squarespace, which makes it easy to turn your idea into a unique website. Showcase your work, blog or publish content, even sell products and services of all kinds in just a few clicks. You can customize everything from look and feel to settings and products using beautiful templates created by world-class designers. Your work instantly looks professional, and there's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. The future is coming. Make it brighter with Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code GRAMMAR to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and boy, am I glad to be back. That cold I had was a doozy. Wash your hands, people. I hope you enjoyed hearing Ellen Hendrickson. She's the best, and I encourage you to check out her book about social anxiety that was released this week. It's called How to Be Yourself. I read it, and I loved it. And now, on to the show. This week, I have a meaty middle about something called the pin-pen merger. A second meaty middle about calling people Americans. I guess this show is like a McDouble hamburger. And a tidbit about the difference between half staff and half mast. Let's get started. A listener named Anne wrote in with this question Have you written something about the way some people pronounce short E and short I the same? For example, my husband says pin, P I N and pen, P-E-N, the same way. Sort of like a combination of how each is supposed to sound separately. And it fascinates me that he says he can't hear a difference when I say them differently. I now ask my husband to spell words for me to avoid having any more misunderstandings. He thinks I'm crazy. I grew up in Minnesota, and I think it's a Southern thing. Anne has stumbled into the world of dialects. Versions of a single language that have differences in pronunciation of certain sounds, in vocabulary, and even in rules of grammar. The variation that's tripping up Anne and her husband is an example of something called a vowel merger, which happens when people who speak a dialect stop making a distinction between two vowels. This particular merger is well known to dialectologists, who call it the pin-pen merger. That's right, they named it after the same pair of words that Anne is asking about, probably because those are the most common words where this merging of two vowels causes confusion. This merger turns other pairs of words into homophones too, but usually the meanings are different enough that context clears up any confusion. For example, speakers who have the pin-pen merger will also have identical pronunciations for bin, as in the container, and Ben, the shortened version of the name Benjamin. But really, how many situations can there be where you just don't know if someone is talking about, say, a recycling bin or some guy named Ben? The same goes for him, the masculine pronoun, and hem, as in Aardvark needs to hem his tuxedo because the legs are too long. But the pin-pen merger doesn't completely level the distinction between short I and short E. It happens only before a nasal consonant. That is an M or an N. Speakers with the pin-pen merger will still hear the difference between words like pit and pet, fill and fell, and miss and mess. Anne suspects that this merger is a southern thing, and she's right. Although dialect features can be associated with race, gender, class, or other demographic traits, Some of the best-known features are associated with particular geographic regions. According to the Atlas of North American English by William LeBeau, Sharon Ash, and Charles Boberg, the pin-pen merger is a feature of English spoken in the southern United States. Furthermore, just as Anne observed, the vowel that these speakers use in words such as pin and pen really is in between the short I and the short E. The Atlas of North American English even has a graph showing the measurable acoustic difference between the ordinary short I and short E vowels and the merged vowel. I'll put a link in the transcript at quickanddirtytips.com so you can see it if you want to. Another vowel merger in American English is much more widespread than the pin-pen merger. It's known as the cot-cot merger. 
In dialects with this merger, the word caught, the past sense of catch, has the same vowel as cot, the kind of uncomfortable bed you might have slept on at summer camp. Now, in my dialect, the vowels in cot and caught are distinct. Did they sound different to you when I said them just now? They did to me. In the word caught, as in squiggly tossed and turned so much that he fell out of his cot, I used the short O vowel in phonetics terminology. As for caught, as in aardvark caught fenster red-handed, I used a vowel that doesn't have an easily pronounceable name in the phonetics system. It's sometimes written as an O with a pointed symbol called a circumflex over it. For most speakers with the caught-caught merger, both words have a short O sound. It's actually somewhat surprising that my dialect doesn't have the caught-caught merger, because I grew up in Seattle, and according to the Atlas of North American English, the caught-caught merger's territory covers the western United States. I won't try to solve that mystery today, but the caught-caught merger is also prevalent in Canada, New England, and a swath of land stretching from western Pennsylvania south through West Virginia and into Kentucky. Not only does the caught-caught merger cover more geographic area than the pin-pen merger, it also covers more phonetic area. Whereas the pin-pen merger happens only before nasal consonants, the caught-caught merger takes place in a much wider variety of phonetic environments. This opens up many more possibilities for confusion between speakers who do have the merger and those who don't. For example, it just so happens that Squiggly's dialect, but not Aardvark's, has the caught-caught merger. And they can tell you a funny story about this one time when Squiggly was talking about a male acquaintance named Don, but Aardvark thought he was talking about a mutual female friend named Dawn. It took about ten minutes before they got that straightened out. And then there was the time that Aardvark was complaining about a stalker in their local supermarket. Eventually, Squiggly realized that Aardvark was talking about an employee who puts merchandise on shelves. He stocks the shelves. But only after he'd told Aardvark that he should have called the police about this stalker. Then Aardvark was like, why would I do that? I don't like how he always puts the chocolate-covered ants on the highest shelf, but it's not a crime. You can see how, when words sound alike, it can cause confusion. Even with ambiguities like caught and caught, dawn and dawn, and stalker and stalker, there are a few words where even speakers with the caught-caught merger distinguish between the two vowels. In particular, the interjection, ah, which you might utter as you relax into a comfortable bed, still sounds different from ah, which you might say when looking at pictures of your friend's newborn baby. There are other vowel mergers in addition to the pin, pen, and cot, cot mergers. There's also such a thing as a vowel split. There are even chains of vowel changes, where one vowel starts to be pronounced like another one, which then begins to be pronounced like yet another in a domino-like sequence. We might talk about some of those other changes in a future episode, but if you can't wait that long, you can find out more about them in the Atlas of North American English. I also recommend the most recent episode of the podcast Lingthusiasm, the podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics, which talks about chain shifts. It's episode 17 called Vowel Gymnastics, and I'll put a link in the show notes. If you have a funny story about vowel variations leading to misunderstandings, I'd love to hear them. Please leave a comment on this article at quickanddirtytips.com or send me a tweet. I'm Grammar Girl on Twitter. That segment was written by Neil Whitman, who blogs about linguistics at literalminded.wordpress.com and is a regular columnist for the online resource Visual Thesaurus. Now stay tuned because I have lots of great stuff for you after the break. Support for today's show comes from HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. No more time-consuming meal planning or grocery shopping. HelloFresh makes it easy to cook delicious, balanced meals for less than $10 a meal. Just choose your delivery day and everything gets sent right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging. It's wonderful. With three plans to choose from, including classic veggie and family, there's something for everyone. 
Plus, there are lots of one-pot recipes for seriously speedy cooking and minimal cleanup. You'll look forward to your HelloFresh box delivery as the highlight of your week, knowing dinner just got that much easier. I actually have a new favorite meal that I got from HelloFresh. It's just called Veggie Jumble. It's sweet potatoes, red onions, tomato, avocado, with a chimichurri dressing. It is a lot easier to try new recipes when someone sends you not only the recipe, but also the ingredients. And what I like about HelloFresh in particular is that the meals really are healthy. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and enter the code GRAMMAR30. That's HelloFresh.com, offer code GRAMMAR30 for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. And Grammar Girl is also brought to you by Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Are you getting ready to tackle your spring cleaning? This year, use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to take on the impossible stains your sprays and wipes can't. I tried it on my tough messes and it blew me away. I used it on my glass shower door, and in a couple of swipes, it had completely removed soap scum that I had given up on ever getting off. I wish I had known about this years ago, and I'm actually excited to be able to tell you about it. It's so amazing, I wish I would have made a video. But now my door is clean. (laughs) All you have to do is wet it under the tap, give it a squeeze, and it's ready to erase. And because it cleans with water alone, you don't have to worry about harsh cleaning fumes or scents. If you're about to take on your spring cleaning, you should definitely try Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It makes cleaning your toughest kitchen and bathroom messes fast and easy. Check out mrclean.com slash grammargirl to see more ways the magic eraser can help you knock out impossible messes all around the house. And now, on to the word American. Elaine, who is from Colombia and listens in Canada, left a nice review on Apple Podcasts and also wrote, quote, I wonder if you could comment on the word American when you're referring to the people of the United States. As a Colombian citizen, I know that me too, I am American. But at the same time, I feel excluded when a person from the U.S. says the word American. And he notes that I use the word American quite often myself. Is it correct that the United States have appropriated this word for themselves while excluding Canadians and everything from Mexico to Patagonia? Unquote. Elaine is not alone in his thinking. Listeners from the United States have also reported having people from Brazil and Argentina upset with them for describing themselves as Americans. And I actually remember thinking about this topic when I was in South America over Christmas. I did cover the topic in my book, 101 Troublesome Words, and today I'm going to expand on that topic. We, the people of the United States of America, have been calling ourselves Americans since before our country was even founded, as have others. And American is the only single word we have to refer to citizens of the United States of America. And this isn't a new problem. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage says the first objection occurred in 1791. And in his 1963 book, The American Language, H.L. Mencken wrote, quote, As everyone knows, the right of Americans to be so-called is frequently challenged, especially in Latin America. But so far, no plausible substitute has been devised, though many have been proposed. For example, Unisians, United Statesians, and Columbards, unquote. Although all of the people of the American continents are actually Americans, most readers in the United States, Canada, and Europe assume that an American is a United States citizen, since that's how the word is most commonly used. First, we'll look at the recommendations of some style guides published in the United States. And then we'll look at some style guides published in other countries and see what they all have to say. The AP Stylebook and Gardner's Modern English Usage both back the use of American to mean a United States citizen. And despite recording all the discord about the term, Merriam-Webster says American to mean a citizen of the United States is fully established. But lest you think I'm biasing my sources by using American books, the style guide of The Guardian, a UK paper, allows the word American to refer to U.S. citizens, And the Canadian Style Guide from the Public Works and Government Services in Canada doesn't address the topic directly, but uses American throughout its guide to refer to United States citizens. My conclusion is that even though it's not literally correct, 
It's the accepted standard to use American to refer to a citizen of the United States of America, at least if you're in an English-speaking country, because people know what it means and no better term has caught on. People in other countries call us other things, though. For example, people who speak Portuguese might call me a Norte Americano, which means a North American, or an Estadunidense, which means United Statesian. I do value accuracy, so I'm going to try to be more careful about this in the future and think about when it might make sense to use United States, where I may have reflexively used America in the past. I also discovered two peripheral but fascinating things while I was researching this topic that I want to share with you. First, I was surprised to learn that the concept of what makes a continent isn't the same everywhere in the world. In the United States, we're taught that there are seven continents, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. So I was thinking that maybe it's a little disingenuous for people to complain that they're all Americans when I'd use the continent names and think of them as North Americans or South Americans. It would be kind of like West Virginians objecting to residents of the state of Virginia calling themselves Virginians. However, apparently in other parts of the world, people are taught that North America and South America are one continent, America, and thus there are only six continents. If you're thinking about continent labels, it really is legitimate to say we're all Americans. Furthermore, some systems combine Europe and Asia into one big Eurasian continent and teach that there are only five continents. The second interesting thing I discovered is what an illogical mass demonyms can be in general. Demonym is the word that names an inhabitant. So Nevadan is the demonym for people who live in Nevada. And Denizen is the name for a person who lives somewhere. So I'm a denizen of Nevada. There seems to be no reason why people call themselves certain things. We have Vermonters and New Yorkers. But other people call themselves Kansans and Iowans, Kentuckians and Missourians, and Wisconsinites and New Hampshireites. People have tried to come up with rules for which ending a demonym will take, given its spelling, such as if the name ends in I-A, add an N, which gives us Philadelphian, and if a name ends in O, add an A-N, give us Chicagoan, but there are a lot of exceptions. Further, it's easy to find instances in which people have two different official or accepted names. For example, the United States government printing office calls people of Indiana Indianans, but the state of Indiana says the official name for residents is Hoosiers. The feds call Massachusetts residents Massachusetts, but the state itself calls people Bay Staters. Although residents of Idaho are generally called Idahoans, Residents of Moscow, Idaho, had a local newspaper called the Daily Idahonian. And my editor, Joe, says he's from Connecticut and his people never know what to call themselves. Connecticuter? Connecticutan? Nutmegger? It's a mess. The best advice I can give you is if you need to use a denizen label, and even country names, and you're writing for a local audience, look up what the accepted name is in the region. If you're writing for a national or international audience, check a major style guide for accepted usage. Finally, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between flying a flag at half-staff and flying a flag at half-mast. The tradition of lowering the flag to show grieving and acknowledge death or tragedy likely began in 1612 when a British ship, Hearts Ease, lost its captain at sea and returned to port with the flag lowered in his honor. Although we use the term half-mast, it's something of a misnomer because the flag is often lowered not halfway down the mast, but by just the height of one flag. The story is that the Heartsease sailors were making room for an invisible flag of death at the top, and the tradition has continued to this day. To properly fly a flag at half-mast, tradition calls for the flag to actually be raised all the way to the top of the mast— and then be brought down to its lowered position. We have two names for lowering the flag because flags can hang on staffs on land and on masts on ships. Although many people aren't aware of the difference, in general, a flag is flown at half-staff on land and half-mast on a ship. And of course, half-mast and half-staff can be used metaphorically. 
For example, describing people making a seductive gaze as lowering their eyelids to half-mast seems to be somewhat common in romance novels. And finally, both half-mast and half-staff are hyphenated. In addition to thanking Elaine again, thank you also to KG Wrights for the nice review, and to two teachers, Mary and Eric, who listened to the podcast while driving home from San Francisco after getting married, and to Valentino Jean, who listens in Haiti. Oh, and my first book, the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing, is on sale as an ebook this month, I think just in the United States, for just two ninety nine. dollars so if you've been thinking about getting a book, now's a good time. You can get it while it's cheap. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>